History is neatly packed into named ages, which better help our understanding. One queen would reign over an empire and define an age of revolution in science. This is the history of Queen Victoria. Victoria was born at quarter past four in the morning of 24th of May 1819 at Kensington Palace in London. Victoria was the daughter of Princess Victoria of saxe coburg selfled and Prince Edward, Duke of Kent, the fourth son of the reigning King of the United Kingdom, George III. Victoria was christened privately by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Charles Manners Sutton, on the 24th of June 1819 at Kensington Palace. She was baptised Alexandrina after one of her godparents, Tsar Alexander I of Russia, and Victoria after her mother. At birth, Victoria was fifth in the line of succession after the four eldest sons of George III, the Prince Regent, later George IV, Frederick, Duke of York, William, Duke of Clarence, later William IV, and Victoria's father, Edward, Duke of Kent. The Prince Regent had no surviving children, and the Duke of York had no children. Further, both were estranged from their wives, who were both past childbearing age, so the two eldest brothers were unlikely to have any further legitimate children. William and Edward married on the same day in 1818, but both of William's legitimate daughters died as infants. Victoria's father died in January 1820, when Victoria was less than a year old. A week later, her grandfather died and was succeeded by his eldest son, George IV. Victoria was then third in line to the throne, after Frederick and William. The Duke of York died in 1827, followed by George IV in 1830. The throne passed to their next surviving brother, William, and Victoria became heir presumptive. The Regency Act of 1830 made special provision for Victoria's mother to act as regent in case William died while Victoria was still a minor. King William distrusted the Duchess's capacity to be regent, and in 1836 he declared in her presence that he wanted to live until Victoria's 18th birthday, so that a regency would be avoided. Victoria later described her childhood as rather melancholy. Her mother was extremely protective, and Victoria was raised largely isolated from other children, under the so-called Kensington system, an elaborate set of rules and protocols devised by the Duchess and her ambitious and domineering comptroller, Sir John Conroy, who was rumoured to be the Duchess's lover. The system prevented the princess from meeting people whom her mother and Conroy deemed undesirable and was designed to render her weak and dependent upon them. The Duchess avoided the court because she was scandalised by the presence of King William's illegitimate children. Victoria shared a bedroom with her mother every night, studied with private tutors to a regular timetable and spent her play hours with dolls and her King Charles Spaniel named Dash. Her lessons included French, German, Italian and Latin, but she spoke only English at home. In 1830, the Duchess of Kent, Anne Conroy, took Victoria across the centre of England to visit the Melbourne Hills, stopping at towns and great country houses along the way. Similar journeys to other parts of England and Wales were taken in 1832 to 1835. Victoria disliked the trips. The constant round of public appearances made her tired and ill, and there was little time for her to rest. She objected on the grounds of the king's disapproval, as he feared the people saw her as a rival rather than an heir. But her mother dismissed his complaints as motivated by jealousy and forced Victoria to continue the tours. At Ramsgate in October 1835, Victoria contracted a severe fever, which Conroy initially dismissed as a childish pretense. While Victoria was ill, Conroy and the Duchess unsuccessfully badgered her to make Conroy her private secretary. As a teenager, Victoria resisted persistent attempts by her mother and Conroy to appoint him to her staff. Once Queen, she banned him from her presence, but he remained in her mother's household. By 1836, 
Victoria's maternal uncle Leopold, who had been king of the Belgians since 1831, hoped to marry her to Prince Albert, the son of his brother Ernest I, Duke of Saxe Coburg and Gotha. Leopold arranged for Victoria's mother to invite her Coburg relatives to visit her in May 1836, with the purpose of introducing Victoria to Albert. William IV, however, disapproved of any match with the Coburgs, and instead favoured the suit of Prince Alexander of the Netherlands, second son of the Prince of Orange. Victoria was aware of the various matrimonial plans and critically appraised a parade of eligible princes. According to her diary, she enjoyed Albert's company from the beginning. After the visit, she wrote, Albert is extremely handsome. His hair is about the same colour as mine, his eyes are large and blue, and he has a beautiful nose and a very sweet mouth with fine teeth, but the charm of his countenance is his expression, which is most delightful. Alexander, on the other hand, she described as very plain. Victoria turned 18 on the 24th of May 1837, and a regency was avoided. Less than a month later, on the 20th of June 1837, William IV died at the age of 71, and Queen Victoria became Queen of the United Kingdom. In her diary she wrote, I was awoke at six o'clock by Mama, who told me the Archbishop of Canterbury and Lord Conningham were here and wished to see me. I got out of bed and went into my sitting room, only in my dressing gown and alone saw them. Lord Conningham then acquainted me that my poor uncle, the King, was no more, and had expired at twelve minutes past two this morning, and consequently that I am Queen. Official documents prepared on the first day of her reign described her as Alexandrina Victoria, but the first name was withdrawn at her own wish and was not used again. Her coronation took place on the 28th of June 1838 at Westminster Abbey. Over 400,000 visitors came to London for the celebrations. She became the first sovereign to take up residence at Buckingham Palace and inherited the revenues of the duchies of Lancaster and Cornwall as well as being granted a civil list allowance of £385,000 a year. Financially prudent, she paid off her father's debts. At the time of Victoria's ascension, the government was led by the Whig Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne. He at once became a powerful influence on the politically inexperienced monarch, who relied on him for advice. At the start of her reign, Victoria was popular, but her reputation suffered in an 1839 court intrigue, when one of her mother's ladies-in-waiting, Lady Flora Hastings, developed an abdominal growth that was widely rumoured to be an out-of-wedlock pregnancy by Sir John Conroy. Victoria believed the rumours. She hated Conroy and despised Lady Flora because she had conspired with Conroy and the Duchess of Kent in the Kensington system. At first, Lady Flora refused to submit to an intimate medical examination until in mid-February she eventually consented and was found to be a virgin. Conroy, the Hastings family and the opposition Tories organised a press campaign implicating the Queen in the spreading of false rumours about Lady Flora. When Lady Flora died in July, the post-mortem revealed a large tumour on her liver that has distended her abdomen. At public appearances, Victoria was hissed and jeered as Mrs Melbourne. Though Victoria was now Queen, as an unmarried young woman, she was required by social convention to live with her mother. Despite their differences over the Kensington system and her mother's continued reliance on Conroy, her mother was consigned to a remote apartment in Buckingham Palace and Victoria refused to see her. When Victoria complained to Melbourne that her mother's proximity promised torment for many years, Melbourne sympathised but said it could be avoided by marriage which Victoria called a shocking alternative. Victoria showed interest in Albert's education for the future role he would have to play as her husband, but she resisted attempts to rush her into wedlock. Victoria continued to praise Albert following his second visit in October 1839. Albert and Victoria 
felt mutual affection and the Queen proposed to him on the 15th of October 1839, just five days after he had arrived at Windsor. They were married on the 10th of February in 1840 in the Chapel Royal of St James's Palace, London. Victoria was lovestruck. She spent the evening after their wedding lying down with a headache but wrote ecstatically in her diary. I never, never spent such an evening. My dearest, dearest, dear Albert, his excessive love and affection gave me feelings of heavenly love and happiness I never could have hoped to have felt before. He clasped me in his arms and we kissed each other again and again. His beauty, his sweetness and gentleness. Really, how can I ever be thankful enough to have such a husband? To be called by names of tenderness, I have never yet heard used to me before, was bliss beyond belief. Oh, this was the happiest day of my life. Albert became an important political advisor, as well as the Queen's companion, replacing Melbourne as the dominant influence figure in her first half of her life. Victoria's mother was evicted from the palace, and through Albert's mediation, relations between mother and daughter slowly improved. During Victoria's first pregnancy in 1840, in the first few months of her marriage, 18-year-old Edward Oxford attempted to assassinate her while she was riding in a carriage with Prince Albert on her way to visit her mother. Oxford fired twice, but either both bullets missed or, as he later claimed, the guns had no shot. He was tried for high treason, found not guilty by reason of insanity, committed to an insane asylum indefinitely, and later sent to live in Australia. In the immediate aftermath of the attack, Victoria's popularity soared. Further attempts were made. On the 29th of May 1842, Victoria was riding in a carriage along the Mall, London, when John Francis aimed a pistol at her, but the gun did not fire. The assailant escaped. The following day, Victoria drove the same route, though faster and with a greater escort, in a deliberate attempt to bait Francis into taking a second aim and catch him in the act. As expected, Francis shot at her, but he was seized by a plain-clothed policeman and convicted of high treason. On the 3rd of July, two days after Francis' death sentence was commuted to transportation for life, John William Bean also tried to fire a pistol at the Queen, but it was loaded only with paper and tobacco and had too little charge. Edward Oxford felt that the attempts were encouraged by his acquittal in 1840. Bean was sentenced to 18 months in jail. In a similar attack in 1849, unemployed Irishman William Hamilton fired a pound of filled pistol at Victoria's carriage as it passed along Constitution Hill, London. In 1850, the Queen did sustain injury when she was assaulted by a possibly insane ex-army officer, Robert Payne. As Victoria was riding in a carriage, Pate struck her with his cane, crushing her bonnet and bruising her forehead. Both Hamilton and Paint were sentenced to seven years' transportation. In March 1861, Victoria's mother died, with Victoria at her side. Through reading her mother's papers, Victoria discovered that her mother had loved her deeply. She was heartbroken and blamed Conroy for wickedly estranging her from her mother. To relieve his wife during her intense and deep grief, Albert took on most of her duties, despite being ill himself with chronic stomach trouble. In August, Victoria and Albert visited their son, Albert Edward, Prince of Wales, who was attending army manoeuvres near Dublin, and spent a few days holidaying in Killarney. In November, Albert was made aware of gossip that his son had slept with an actress in Ireland. Appalled, he travelled to Cambridge where his son was studying to confront him. By the beginning of December, Albert was very unwell. He was diagnosed with typhoid fever by William Jenner and died on the 14th of December 1861. Victoria was devastated. She blamed her husband's death on worry over the Prince of Wales's philandering. He had been killed by that dreadful business, she said. She entered a state of mourning and wore black for the remainder of her life. She avoided public appearances and rarely set foot in London in the following years. 
Her seclusion earned her the nickname Widow of Windsor. Her weight increased through comfort eating, which reinforced her aversion to public appearances. In 1887, the British Empire celebrated Victoria's Golden Jubilee. She marked the 50th anniversary of her ascension on the 20th of June with a banquet to which 50 kings and princes were invited. The following day, she participated in a procession and attended a Thanksgiving service in Westminster Abbey. By this time, Victoria was once again extremely popular. On the 23rd of September 1896, Victoria surpassed her grandfather George III as the longest reigning monarch in British history. The Queen requested that any special celebrations be delayed until 1897 to coincide with her Diamond Jubilee, which was made a festival of the British Empire at the suggestion of the Colonial Secretary, Joseph Chamberlain. The Prime Minister and all the self-governing dominions were invited to London for the festivities. The Queen's Diamond Jubilee procession on the 22nd of June 1897 followed a route six miles long through London and included troops from all over the Empire. The procession paused for an open-air service of thanksgiving held outside St Paul's Cathedral, throughout which Victoria sat in the open carriage to avoid her having to climb the steps to enter the building. The celebration was marked by vast crowds of spectators and a great outpouring of affection for the 78-year-old Queen. In July 1900, Victoria's second son Alfred died. She wrote in her journal, Oh God, my poor darling Elfie, gone to... It is a horrible year, nothing but sadness and horrors of one kind and another. Following a custom she maintained throughout her widowhood, Victoria spent the Christmas of 1900 at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. Rheumatism in her legs had rendered her disabled and her eyesight was clouded by cataracts. Through early January she felt weak and unwell and by mid-January she was drowsy and dazed and confused. She died on the 22nd of January 1901 at half past six in the evening at the age of 81. Her son and successor King Edward VII and her eldest grandson Emperor Wilhelm II were at her deathbed. With a reign of 63 years, 7 months and 2 days, Victoria was the longest reigning British monarch and the longest reigning Queen Regnant in world history until her great great granddaughter Elizabeth II surpassed her on the 9th of September 2015. She was the last monarch of Britain from the House of Hanover. Her son and successor, Edward VII, belonged to her husband's house of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha. Having nine children which married into royal families across Europe, Victoria was known as the Grandmother of Europe. Places were named in her honour, as was the Victoria Cross, introduced in 1856 to reward acts of valour during the Crimean War, and it remains the highest British, Canadian, Australian and New Zealand award for bravery.